My name is Rick Snyder and I serve as the president of the Indianapolis Fraternal Order of Police. I stand before you on behalf of our 3,000 active and retired officers and their families. Today we rise to provide additional information following the statements and the representations made by the Marion County Prosecutor three days ago on Monday, April 19th. Following the tragic events which occurred last week at the FedEx facility on the southwest side of our community. As we all now know, 13 of our fellow neighbors were victims of mass violence. Tragically, eight people lost their lives. Five more were injured, and the suspect took his life. Our organization has learned from public statements that the suspect involved in this matter had a previous documented incident of intervention last year with the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department on March 3rd, 2020, in which law enforcement officers made a legally authorized immediate detention of the subject involved and seized the firearm that was present during the investigation of suicidal ideations. In fact, we are told that the threats were made to complete a suicide by cop. As such, Indianapolis law enforcement took proactive measures to make a warrantless seizure of the firearm pursuant to the Jake Laird red flag law. We have learned the necessary follow-on investigation was completed by the IMPD firearms unit and a sworn affidavit was submitted to the Marion County Prosecutor's Office for filing with the appropriate court. In short, the police took all steps available to them to ensure lawful intervention measures were completed for the safety of the individual involved and the community at large. Subsequently, we have learned that the Marion County Prosecutor failed to do his part by filing the necessary paperwork with the courts that would have triggered the hearing required under the statute. Instead, the Marion County Prosecutor highlighted that his perceived shortcomings of the red flag law as a basis for his decision to not initiate court proceedings. In fact, he acknowledged that because the family had agreed to pursue, who, pers agreed to not pursue release of the firearm in question, he was satisfied with the outcome. Unfortunately, the lack of action by the Marion County Prosecutor prevented a court hearing, which could have resulted not only in the retention of the firearm in question, but also could have prohibited the suspect from owning, renting, receiving transfer of, or possessing any other firearms. As a result of this missed opportunity, we now know the suspect was able to legally purchase firearms months later, which were used or believed to be used in the attack last week. Make no mistake, the ultimate responsibility for this tragic event rests with the criminal suspect. However, the magnitude of this tragedy begs important questions. Why didn't the prosecutor seek the hearing that the statute requires? Why didn't the prosecutor use all the legal tools available? Why didn't the prosecutor try? The prosecutor outlined his desire to have subpoenaed certain uh, medical records regarding the mental health of the suspect, yet the prosecutor failed to utilize readily available testimonial evidence and blames the statutory goal of a 14-day timeline as his rationale for not seeking a hearing. This is a peculiar position given the other existing timelines that exist within law enforcement, policing, and the criminal justice system. Think with me for just a moment. Law enforcement officers are often required to make life and death decisions in a fraction of a second, literally in the blink of an eye. Additionally, once an officer makes a criminal arrest, probable cause must be established and supporting documentation submitted within 72 hours. That's just three days. Yet under the Jake Laird red flag law, the prosecutor had nearly five times as many days to submit a sworn affidavit provided to him by police that would allow the state to retain the firearm or firearms in question and seek the prohibition of further firearm possession. Additionally, nothing within the statute prohibits a continuance and the law does not prohibit the prosecutor from seeking to supplement the record if the court took the matter under advisement. So again, we ask the question, why didn't the prosecutor try? As police officers, we know all too well the pain and the grief of losing a family member, a colleague, a friend, to an act of violence. In fact, the enactment of this red flag law was initiated by the immediate family, the parents of Officer Jake Laird, with the support of our fraternal order of police following the mass shooting of five police officers, which included the ultimate sacrifice of Officer Jake Laird in 2004. Since its establishment in 2005, the law has been utilized over 800 times in the state of Indiana. 
And there are indications that over half of this number of cases actually originated from Marion County. Now, we have not heard from past prosecutors of Marion County or other prosecuting attorneys from other counties expressing their inability to operate under the prescribed timelines. We, so, we also see no reason why this prosecutor's office couldn't abide by the same rules. Instead, the excuse outlined of his concern as to whether the courts would uphold the retention and subsequent suspension of rights is actually akin to an officer failing to take law enforcement action because they believe the prosecutor may not file charges. In fact, Indiana law expressly prohibits such officer discretion in matters of domestic violence and drunk driving investigations. And why? It's because the potential for deadly outcomes outweighs the use of discretion in such instances. So why would the same principle not apply to matters of mental health and or threats of violence while in possession of firearms? Therefore, we rise in defense of the Jake Laird Law. The red flag process has proven valuable in interrupting cycles of violence, suicide, and attacks upon our fellow residents and our law enforcement officers. Regardless, here's the main point. The efficacy of the statute is not even, it's not even a relevant question related to the tragedy at hand because the law was never even tried or applied by the prosecutor. Collectively, we are horrified by the tragic events which occurred a week ago today at the FedEx on the southwest side of our community. Our chief of police from IMPD, Randy Taylor, he publicly stated that the people present, including the victims, fellow employees, the responding officers, firefighters, and EMS, they all saw things that no human being should ever witness. The ripple effects of this acute traumatic event will be felt for many years to come by those directly and indirectly affected. In short, our city has been changed by this senseless act. Such events remind all of us that evil does truly exist in our fallen world. Yet such incidents do not dictate the true nature of our community. They reveal it. From the brave police officers who sacrificially ran toward the scene, believing they too could suffer fatal consequences, to the firefighters and EMS personnel who arrived to treat the wounded and transport victims to medical facilities, or the detectives and crime scene technicians who responded to piece the facts together, to diligently collect and analyze evidence to provide an accurate synopsis of what occurred. Some may ask, did they rush to the scene to help regardless of the dangers? They did it by the dozens. And we are confident that in the coming days we will learn more of the heroic and selfless actions of many that were involved. And we know this because of the first 108 hours immediately following this incident, our FOP worked to ensure our police officers, detectives, dispatchers, and others affected would have the immediate resources available to them. We worked tirelessly to make sure they had someone to listen to their pain, have a shoulder to lean on, and have proper follow-on resources to process their feelings from a source of strength. In the countless comments, expressions of grief, and statements of fear, anger, and anguish, a consistent question was raised. Could something have been done to possibly interrupt the chain of events that led to this outcome? And we now know that an opportunity did exist. Therefore, we want to make clear, a loophole did not thwart this opportunity. Instead, the process was sidestepped. So today, we call for answers, and we call for accountability. Any questions? What would you like to see the prosecutor do now? Well, I think, I think the first thing is acknowledge that uh, this is one that apparently uh, slipped through the cracks because accountability, the law was not applied to ensure that uh, a due process occurred. And, uh, you know, regardless of what is believed about the law uh, in question, again, as I said before, none of that matters if it's never applied to begin with. It's a mood issue. And, uh, you know, it was uh, unfortunate, unfortunate uh, in the opinion of our law enforcement officers to see somebody within the criminal justice process um, in acknowledging that they didn't do their part of the equation, uh, then point fingers and try to distract away from that. Have you spoken to the officers who responded in March 2020? And did they at the time express concern and try to push the prosecutor to proceed with a red flag order? 
I have not had the opportunity to do that yet. However, I did uh, review, you know, and in fairness to the prosecutor, he says that he's talked about this before. He did, right? There was a media report in February of 2020, right, uh, in which he talked about this. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is, is he made this comment, that he believed that family members are courageous when they ask police to take a gun away from a loved one. He then said he thought lawmakers needed to show the same kind of courage. Well, I would ask you, where was his courage to file the paperwork? Apply the law and initiate the process. Um, this is the whole point of having laws such as this. And it's tragic when you see someone uh, obfuscate, not, not fulfill uh, their role, and then utilize losses of life and tragedies and all these other things to then advocate a political agenda additional changes, whatnot. Um, politics should have no role in this. This is about the people. Has this been an issue or a concern before where you're seeing a prosecutor's office not um, pursue these proceedings? Well, specific to this issue, mental health. Mental health is a, a, a top challenge, not just for Indianapolis, but for any community. But let's talk about what occurs in Indianapolis. In 2020, we're told that there were at least 3,670 immediate detentions in our city sure suggests that there's an issue there, right? And so when we have issues of firearms involved in that, and we have concerns about threats uh, made or, or actions taken, we are relying, law enforcement officers, you know, the ones that are actually on the front lines responding to these incidents and taking these folks into custody and placing them into an immediate detention, not to cause them problems, but to get them help. We're relying upon the follow-on system, the back of the system, to fulfill its work requirements both in mental health, the medical facilities, and just as importantly, in the prosecutor's office. Do you think the prosecutor failed to do his job then? Well, I think that the prosecutor appears to have raised the, 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 the suggestion that the system failed. But I would point out that in this instance, the system didn't fail. Instead, Prosecutor Mears failed to give the system a chance to work. And that ultimately is the question at hand here. That ultimately is the point. Um, and uh, I, think, I think all of you, our community, our residents, our officers, all those that have been affected by this deserve to be able to ask that question. Why didn't you try? And, 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 and quite honestly, how can we help you do better? I, I don't think there's any question that our community wants strong, proactive steps, especially when we're trying to encourage them to contact us and tell us about these events so that we can intervene, so that uh, we can interrupt. And hopefully, again, the primary focus is helping the person directly involved, the subject of the, of the matter, and protect our community as a whole. I don't think that's too much to ask. We worked hard to get this law. Many people did to get this law. Other states have adopted a similar law. Um, we still have folks that are suffering very traumatic emotional wounds, spiritual wounds from what happened to Officer Laird. And uh, again, the law wasn't the problem in this, in this instance. How many cases have been presented to the prosecutor this year under the J. Clair law? Okay, well on Monday the prosecutor was asked that question. I believe it might have even been by you. Uh, how many times has his office received referrals from the IMPD? Now, when I watched it, I heard him say that he did not have the, those numbers readily available, but he was able to later share that his off in that same press conference that his office had made eight filings so far this year. Well, in our research, we show that the IMPD had submitted at least 45 referrals to his office so far in 2021. So if that is correct, it means that his office has tried to take full advantage of the red flag tool available to them only 18% of the time. And at times like this, why on earth would you not try harder than to get right at two out of every ten of these referrals made to you actually initiated into the system? We understand you're not going to get a successful outcome uh, if, if you think that the person shouldn't have. We, we understand that's not going to happen every single time. But one thing we know for sure is 100% of the time they will not be on the red flag system if you don't try and get it and initiate the process and apply the law. Do those cases, those 30-some cases, need to be reviewed? 
Well, you know, I heard the question uh, being asked. It was a little ironic to me, and forgive me, but I heard many questions being asked, such as, how many times does this occur? How many referrals do you receive? And then what's the adjudication, the outcomes uh, uh, of your work? It sounded strikingly familiar to what we have been advocating for the last two years, which is get the statistics, get the data, put it in a public database, and allow us to evaluate criminal justice outcomes. We have said for many years now, the system is broken, meaning this criminal justice process, because people are not ensuring accountability through the process. Um, and, uh, you know, if nothing else, maybe this is a good place to start. Let's start on these mental health referrals related to the J. Clair law, and then let's proceed and look at other things such as our homicides, non-fatal shootings, and stabbings to review those prior criminal histories and determine if truly one or both parties could not or would not have been there had they been held accountable for prior bad acts. This demonstrates the value of that. Just to clarify statistically, we're not sure how effective this law is at preventing uh, future violence. Well, I, I, I would not stipulate to that. I think, I think science and research has shown that they are effective. They are extremely effective, and it's been demonstrated, especially as it relates to suicides. It's a, it's a great suicide prevention tool. Um, and then, you know, the challenge that you're always going to find in acts of violence, right, is, we've been saying this, it's, it's an issue of the heart. It's human violence. It's difficult to predict. And uh, it's difficult uh, to, to just know when something is going to happen, right? So your whole goal has to be to educate the public, take steps to prevent violent actions from occurring, and then when necessary, ensure that we've got strong intervention that is available and that occurs. And then in doing so, we will build trust, trust and respect with our community and receive the collaboration of them to call, report this, uh, uh, report when their family member is struggling with a mental health addiction issue, whatever the case may be, especially when firearms or other weapons are involved. Um, I don't think anyone would contend that not taking this step uh, makes things better. The prosecutor has said that the 14-day time frame that he's working with to file the red flag isn't enough time to gather medical records and things of that nature. Are your response to that? Well, as I said in my comments, there's nothing that prohibits the prosecutor from seeking a continuance and the opportunity to get those additional medical records. But just as importantly, there's nothing that prevents the prosecutor from using, utilizing the testimonial narratives that are available to them, the witness statements, the, the statements of the officers, the observations, and the evidence. Quite frankly, just like every other uh, criminal investigation that we deal with. And so, remember what I said, a regular criminal investigation, you only have three days. You only have three days to make that filing and provide that information. How are we doing that every other day of the year, but somehow they, he, whoever, cannot get it done in 15 days? Uh, I think that is a red herring. I think it's a distraction. And uh, quite frankly, I don't think it's an excuse that many people buy. Other questions? I think one of the key things that was brought up is this concern about uh, whether or not when somebody uh, receives the referral, if there needs to be a strengthening, right, an enhancement. safe, dangerous person in possession of the firearm, that they could be prevented through this process from purchasing another firearm. That was House Enrolled Act 1651. It actually enhanced the crime if you uh, provided a firearm to a prohibited person, and it strengthened the law and made it a level 5 felony. So steps have been taken, but even our state office holders have publicly agreed that the law was never used in this instance. That is the key salient point. So no, en so no enhancements will make a difference in the law if it is intentionally sidestepped. Do you believe, and I know you, you say some of these details are moot because the law wasn't pursued, but do you believe in that 14-day time frame, um, should that person, while they're awaiting proceedings, pr proceedings, still have access to or be able to buy new guns? Yeah, you know, you heard one of the, the comments being made is that that's, it's too short and, and too narrow of a time frame to get the work done. Well, remember, the whole premise by that is to 
expedite the process so that if the person is deemed by the court not to be uh, of sound mind, right, or is too dangerous to be in possession of the firearm, they can immediately get them onto the list. That's the whole point in that. So everybody needs to work diligently in an expeditious manner to get it done. Recognizing again that if further information is deemed necessary, there are the outlets and the opportunities to do that. Um, I think the, uh, the ultimate question is you still have to ensure due process for folks, right? I think we would all agree on that. Otherwise, uh, you would say that uh, uh, you would make uh, prejudgments like that on other criminal matters. But here again, I'm not aware of the prosecutor, prosecuting attorney's counsel beating the doors down at the state legislature to get these timelines changed. That's the group that represents our local prosecutors like Prosecutor Mears. So I'm not, I haven't heard it. I checked just as recently as today to see if anything had been filed this legislative session. And to key people I talked about, they're not aware of any such bill being filed this legislative session. They're not really even aware of anything last year. The last remembrance they have was in 2009 when groups like the Fraternal Order of Police and other law enforcement entities help get those enhancements done. Have you reached out to Mears or will you reach out to Mears to discuss this? I'd always be happy to talk to him. Uh, I think the key uh, factor in this is that, hey, if you're identifying issues, why wouldn't you reach out to folks who represent all of our law enforcement officers in the county, right? The largest law enforcement agency in the state of Indiana. And perhaps we could help you refine, sand off the rough edges, and see if there's uh, additional enhancements that may be warranted. Um, we have not received such a call. Rick, is there more that ought to be done in mental health and law enforcement and the way that police approach the mentally ill? Yeah, here's what I would say is, brother, we have been doing everything that police officers can do. Take a look at what IMP does. It's one of the leading, leading police agencies in the country on mental health issues. We've done things such as having a behavioral health unit, right? Fully staffed, full time, and a part of the police department. Many other agencies do not have that. Every one of our officers get trained in crisis intervention training. Every one of them. Many agencies just do that for a specialized unit. We make every single officer on this police department a critical intervention uh, tactician in the city. That's a huge investment that we have made. In addition to that, we've taken pulled out all the stops related to these immediate detentions. Look at that number I just gave you, 3,670 immediate detentions just last year. How many is that per day? You're a smart man. Go do the math, right? It's a lot. But what else does it tell us? It tells us that there's a huge mental health aspect in our community. Now, I'm going to say this to you with all sincerity. That is why last year, I personally and many other people spoke out at our city county council and then went to our Indiana state legislature and begged them to address these issues related to the revolving door of criminal justice. And we highlighted the difficulties and the challenges were of this perfect storm. Mental health crises, uh, narcotics-induced delirium, combined with um, uh, firearms that are illegally possessed. Um, and then when we find somebody who we allege has committed a gun crime, and we then submit them into the system, we simply watch them get cycled right back out, oftentimes having those charges completely pled down, dismissed, um, or very little accountability occurring. So um, I appreciate the question. I just challenge you, go find us another city, a major city, and I'm, not, I'm saying this positively. Go find another major city in the United States of America that is taking as many steps as the IMPD is on this very issue of mental health. What did we just get in the new criminal justice complex? What are we doing there, right? We're, uh, uh, we are, um, we have a, a diversion capability in place where if our officers identify that, listen, even though perhaps even a minor crime, misdemeanor may have occurred here, but we're definitely convinced it's a mental health related issue, rather than cycling that person into incarceration, we're trying to get them into alternative placement so that their medical needs can be addressed. We've been the ones saying that the Marion County Sheriff's Department, they are the number one mental health provider in Marion County. Let me say that again, folks. The number one mental health provider in Marion County and has been for years is the Marion County Sheriff's Department, the jail. Why is that? It's because our community has been let down by people in, in decision-making positions to make the changes to ensure those resources exist. 
so that we don't have to go the route of incarceration. Yet instead, what did we do? We closed down any mental health facilities that were available, right? We siphoned that funding away, and then we said, well, just take the problem and dump it in the lap of law enforcement. Well, we're dealing with it the best that we can. We here in Indianapolis are being more proactive than anyone else that I'm aware of, yet we still are facing these matters. Why? Because the rest of the system has to do its job. Rick, your, your union represents smaller departments in Marion County. That's correct. Well, and, and Speedway had an incident recently, mm -hmm. last month, mm -hmm. um, involving a mentally ill man. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on how that was handled? Well, I'm not going to speak to that specific incident. It's not what we're here for today. But what I would say is it highlights uh, this bigger issue. And I don't even know for sure the, uh, the, the uh, facts, uh, if they've completely been determined related to that person's mental health. But here's the point, right? I think the bigger question is this, and, and, and Chief Taylor recently even spoke to this, just yesterday, was spending the day having to uh, go back and, and speak to the media to communicate a message to the public, which is this, please keep calling us, please keep taking the steps to notify us if your loved one is struggling with these issues. Our objective, our goal, is to provide and ensure that they get medical care is to keep them safe. That's what we do. We're sworn to uphold that. We risk our lives to protect our communities and our fellow neighbors. Um, so please keep calling us. In fact, this is what the chief said, and I'll quote it for you. He said, speaking of this issue and encouraging people to continue to do what they are, are supposed to do, he said, quote, if you, he said, uh, if you don't make the effort, then there's no chance, right? If you make the effort and it didn't work, at least you made the effort. That's the question that we have today. Why didn't the prosecutor do that? Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.